So I wanted to take a look at this big Honey scandal that's going on. If you're not familiar with Honey, Honey is one of those coupon Chrome extensions, which means all of its code is available for me to look at. And so I can take a look at the things that are being alleged in these YouTube videos, and I can actually see, is this happening? But more so with, when it comes to extensions, I can actually look over time and see, were these bad decisions being made and have software engineers made alterations to not only continue on, but make these bad behaviors even better and more robust. Yes, yes they have, and I'm gonna show you how that's happened, but I know there's plenty of you that probably have no idea what's going on, you're not really even familiar with Honey, and so you, don't re you have never really been caught up. This actually involves a very specific operation of Honey that I want to go over. So we're actually gonna watch a three minute excerpt from this latest Honey reveal video. And then I'm gonna talk about going through the minified code and exactly what I found and the intent behind it, which is a bit surprising. Now, if there's one thing people hate more than deception, it's theft. And in my first video, I showed you how Honey was stealing money from influencers. But what I didn't tell you is that this behavior is in most cases, strictly not allowed. You see, the companies that run this industry, the affiliate networks, know full well that coupon extensions like Honey have a high probability of poaching commissions from influencers, bloggers, and other content-driven affiliates. More importantly, they also understand that this is not fair, especially under the last click wins policy, which has remained an industry standard. So to prevent this type of commission theft, most major affiliate networks enforce what's known as a stand down policy. Let me show you what that looks like on Honey. Let's visit newegg.com first without an affiliate link. And as you can see, Honey immediately pops up offering cashback. But if we do this again, this time using my affiliate link for Newegg, you'll notice that Honey doesn't pop up at all. And if we click on the Honey icon, you can see that Honey is now disabled. So that's how Honey is supposed to behave when a user's already clicked on someone else's affiliate link. So where then is the alleged fraud, you ask? Well, as it turns out, Honey has always had a stand down system built into their app, but they have been selectively choosing when and whom to apply the rules. Let's test my affiliate link for Newegg again. Only this time, I have two entirely separate Chrome browsers open at the same time, and each is logged into a different Honey account. The Honey account on the left has zero cashback points, while the Honey account on the right has accumulated cashback points. Now, watch what happens when I open the Newegg affiliate link on both browsers. The Honey account on the left stands down as it did the first time. But look at this, the account on the right, which has cashback points, did not stand down. So why is that? So this is the thing that I wanted to test. I wanted to go through this because this is code. I can understand code. I can look at the JSON that's coming down and I can understand it. Not only that, but the power of AI will allow me to search through minified code at speeds unbeknownst to me just throughout my entire programming universe. So what we did is that we first got a bunch of versions of Honey. So the ones that I kind of went through were starting from about February 2019 all the way up until present day, 1901. And with that, what I wanted to do is go, okay, first off, is this like user point kind of deciding when to and when not to show the stand down menu? Does it exist? Yes, it does quite exist. But the real question was, had it like changed? Because I worked at a big, I've worked at a big company, right? You've worked at a big company, I'm sure you have, or some of you have, and you know that sometimes code just sticks around. You know, it's like whoopsie poopsies, it's just still there, no one's changed it in five years, that's just the way it is. And that's kind of what I was looking for, which is, did the code stick around, or has there been changes that were significant, not like little bug fixes. All right, so to avoid being copyrighted, because apparently PayPal lawyers will copyright, hit them with the DMCA, anyone that actually shows the code. That means I have to do this weird charade dance on the old blackboard to show you what was happening. So starting in version 11, remember, which is about 2019, this version did have the stand down logic. It did even have things that were called SSD stand down logics. It matched the JSON file that comes down with a bunch of data. Here is my stand down uh, of a user that's like not logged in at all, the most basic stuff. And here you can see UP is user points. ADB is a, uh, like ad block last time used. There's also is account logged in, and there's some other fields that seem to crop up every now and then. So what's interesting is in, in 2019 under version 11, things often looked like this. There's like a giant switch statement that ended up having these cases where it was just like, okay, hey, do we test for an email? And yes, it literally had a string. Does this email contain test? 
then always stand down. Which, by the way, shady. It's avoiding these link testing accounts to come in to be have like link share test to go see does this actually work? It, because uh, we, let's just face it, who here hasn't had a tester account that does not contain the test? I most certainly have. But nonetheless, this right here was an explicit check. If you have the word test in your email anywhere, it will disable you. But more so, that I mean, this was already talked about, but more so the things that were really confusing is it'd go through a series of checks and it would be like, hey, is the provider that is uh, currently active equal to LS, which is link share? If it is, I want you to apply these exact rules. And then later on, it had this check where it'd go through all the rules that it figured out, and then it'd go one by one in a little for loop going through each one of these rules and checking, do any of them fail? If any of them fail, it would stand down. So this was a fairly kind of hard-coded process, as you can see, because there was like literal lines saying like, if link share, do this action. If we're in this other provider, do something else. Now, I, of course, have been on many, many of projects where this kind of stuff just happens. This is totally normal. You start off where you're like, okay, hey, we might have one or two providers, and that's that. So I'll just put a little couple hard code edge cases in here, and we'll just make sure things get taken care of in a certain way. We stand down for some amount of duration, which, by the way, was not a very long part. You should watch Megaleg's video to find out exactly how just awful the rules actually were. But again, my goal is to go, okay, did they make changes to the code? Were there bug fixes? What happened? Well, this is where things get a little bit confusing. Because between the versions 11 through 14, uh, which I believe is all the way up until 2022, yes, 2022, things remained pretty much a constant. Nothing really changed, a little bit of edits, nothing to really show much. But starting around, I believe in version 16, so in 2024, there was a robust refactor made such that they can drive a lot of these decisions from an endpoint in Honey. Now, this endpoint sends down an object that looks like this, that has this base value, then it has these values, then it has these values under X. So that means the previous version, it used a bunch, a series of if statements to kind of determine the type of behaviors that it wanted to do, and then it would do rule evaluation to see, did this rule actually pass? Did we actually get out a true or a false? But in version 16, they decided to go a bit more intense when it comes to software engineering. Now we all know, what do you do whenever you have a bunch of if statements that are kind of doing this like wrapping of data and kind of doing a basic mutation on an object? Well, you, you would wanna drive it through some sort of config. You'd wanna drive it through something that is a bit more dynamic to make it a little bit easier. And that's exactly what they did. So if we go back here and look at the data that is coming down for me, a non-logged in Honey user, you will see right here is that I have a base class. This base class will become the base object for how Honey determines. Right now for this non-logged in user base class, I require 65,000 user points for Honey to not stand down. If I have less than 65,000 points, remember I'm not logged in, so I have zero points, it will say, sorry, I'm standing down. I, I'm, I'm avoiding this. Now, when it gets that base, what it then does is it checks how did it get here? Where, what, like, where did we get here? Why did we get here? And it does the next check. Was this from one of these affiliate networks? And then it will start wrapping things. So, okay, so if I come from a link share place, it will now only make my points required 5,001. It will edit this base object. It's actually doing the better, more sophisticated engineering. It's not a series of hard-coded if statements anymore. Instead, it's doing an actual, hey, take dot base. Then I want to say, do you have my provider? If you have my provider, I want to spread in my provider's values or just an empty object. And then it did something even more wild, which is all of these right here under X these are all store specific values. Then it would check, hey, whatever store I'm currently in, I also want to put on those values as well. And then it would go and do the basic rule logic, showing that it's not anymore under some sort of maintenance mode. It's showing that it's no longer kind of this hard coded hacky thing that's been existing for like a decade. Instead, they went from that. And in 2024, they said, you know what? We need to be more robust and we need to be able to make more decisions about more stores and more providers in a more kind of easier to maintain fashion. This was software engineering people and they did it. So when I look at this, what I see is that over time, they have made changes to make their system better, which means that there is an intent behind it. They want to keep whatever the system is doing, whether it is or is not fraudulent, I cannot say that's for somebody else to decide, but I can at least say, that their decisions 
have been to make it more robust and better. And given the fact that the general perception of this system as being pretty shady, they've made their pretty shady system much, much better. But that's not all I found. I, I found something else that kind of piqued my interest. I kept seeing the word Vim that just kept popping up. Now I'm like, Vim, what? What is the text editor doing? When I asked Claude Code about it, it actually said, hey, you're talking about the Vim instance manager that's been found inside of uh, Honey? And I was like, Vim instance manager? Okay, that's that can't be it. That is not it. And then as I started looking at this, what I ended up seeing is that there is an entire JavaScript in JavaScript engine that runs inside the Honey plugin. Now, this is absolutely the strangest thing I have ever seen. Uh, I tried to do some reading up on it. I'm not a plugin developer expert when it comes to Chrome, so I had no idea why anyone would ever run JavaScript in JavaScript. But what Honey does is it actually has Acorn, which is a JavaScript parser and produces an AST from valid JavaScript. And it takes this, evaluates JavaScript, and then feeds it into this Vim engine. Now, there's several references within the code that actually refer to this other object called cart ops retrieval JS and product ops retrieval JS, which sometimes is not null, actually contains code. And it also refers to this JS code, which is also not null sometimes, like right here, it's actual real JavaScript. But as far as I could tell, it's not actually executing any of this code. I tried to set some breakpoints. I never actually got to the point of making it trigger. But nonetheless, this does exist. They have the apparatus set up to be able to execute remote code on your machine based on whatever returns from Honey. In a very, very obfuscated way, this JavaScript in JavaScript, they have a JavaScript parser. They have a JavaScript virtual machine. It is actual JavaScript in the JavaScript. But they also have this one section that there's just all of these stringified functions and they're a bunch of inlined JavaScript that's just filled with ways in which they search through pages and stuff like this. But those ones, those ones come down with the products. So they're not technically against the old uh, Google terms of service. Because if you look at the additional requirements for the manifest V3 for anyone that's doing this is you should not be allowed to use JavaScript eval. Okay, so we're not going to do that. We're not going to eval. What we're going to do is we're going to hard code some operations we don't want other plugins know we're doing. And then we're going to incorporate an entire JavaScript engine to run them to further obfuscate what we are doing. Which is funny because this V3 right here it seems like it was designed for Honey specifically because it says building an interpreter to run complex commands fetched from a remote source, even if those commands are fetched as data. So they get around it. These aren't remote things. These are strings that are actually available within the Honey uh, extension. But man, this is some obfuscation. This is some weird stuff. I cannot personally understand a single reason why this is actually happening. Like I said, apparently it's due to interactions with other extensions, uh, other extensions being ad blockers. Apparently ad blockers might ad block the Honey extension if it directly runs certain functions, but somehow through this weird interpreter, it's able to actually run stuff that is getting avoided to be caught. I don't know, but it seems like a cluster festival to me. And I found this to be very, very interesting because I've never done any sort of reverse engineering. I've never really looked through someone else's source code, especially minified source code. I just wanted to show you guys this. This is perhaps the most unusual engineering I've ever seen in my lifetime. I've been a part of code bases that have 10 plus thousand lines long of weird state machines and are impossible to work with, hard to reason about, but this has to take the cake. This has to be the most complex, weirdest contraption, Rupe Goldberg level I have ever seen. But furthermore, the dynamic rules for doing the stand down stuff, they're robust. Whatever the purpose is, whether it is or isn't fraudulent, it has been designed to be dynamic and to be controlled via JSON on a per store, per provider, and per user basis. But anyways, I want to give a special shout out to Mega Leg. It was really awesome. I got to chat with him. He helped me a little bit kind of looking through some stuff. So big shout out to him. You should definitely check out the video. It's in the description. It's super well done. There are multiple of them and I recommend you watch them all. They're very, very good. Also, do you, do you, do you like this thing that I did? Do you, do you like this format? I don't know. This is kind of new. This is just me spending some time on stream, having fun, and then reporting back to you. If you were on stream, you would have saw this happen live. Could have been a lot more fun for you. The name is I'm not a reverse engineer, but this was a lot of fun. I can see why people do it. A gen. Hey, is that HTTP? 
Get that out of here. That's not how we order coffee. We order coffee via SSH, Terminal.shop. Yeah, you want a real experience? You want real coffee? You want awesome subscriptions so you never have to remember again? Oh, you want exclusive blends with exclusive coffee and exclusive content? Then check out Cron. You don't know what SSH is? Well, maybe the coffee is not for you. Terminal coffee in hand, living the